Hello, my name is Chan Mei Yeok. I'm a pediatric hematologist oncologist from KK Women's and Children's Hospital in Singapore. I'm also an adjunct associate professor at the Centre for Biomedical Ethics at the National University of Singapore. Next, I come to euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide. Euthanasia is often called mercy killing and is the deliberate act by one person, often in this case a medical staff, of hastening the death of another person, often a terminally ill person, in order to relieve that person's suffering. So euthanasia is the active act of hastening death. Physician-assisted suicide, on the other hand, is facilitating a person to hasten his own death. This is uh, usually uh, done by a physician prescribing a lethal medication to the uh, competent person to take it himself and thereby bring about his own death. It is important to note, however, that the law in Singapore does not allow for euthanasia or physician-assisted dying or suicide. However, this is not the case in many countries. As of 2024, euthanasia is legal in about 10 countries. Physician-assisted suicide is legal in many more. As mentioned previously, euthanasia is, is uh, some will differentiate euthanasia into active and passive where there is an active where there is an active act of causing a patient's death by either giving an injection uh, or um, putting uh, um, medications into the uh, feeding tube of a patient who is uh, uh, um, unable to do by himself. Passive euthanasia is where there is an omission of an act that brings about uh, the death of a patient. There is also voluntary and non-voluntary euthanasia. Voluntary euthanasia is where the patient gives his informed consent uh, to, be, uh, um, to be euthanized. Non-voluntary euthanasia occurs when the consent of the patient was not uh, given. For example, in um, children. Uh, who are unable to give uh, consent. In most legislations, non-voluntary uh, euthanasia is considered murder. Um, in Netherlands, uh, there is a protocol called the Groningen uh, Protocol, where uh, pending certain criteria, uh, euthanasia can be applied to children, uh, to infants uh, who are terminally ill and suffering. So are there ethical or moral differences between euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide? Uh, some would say that it is really the same because both acts bring about the uh, death of the patient. However, some would feel that the fact that the patient is the one that administers his own medication, that it is not as morally objectionable as euthanasia, where the act of causing the patient's death is actually in the hands of the physician. The idea about euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide is really revolved around the fact that patients have the right to die. But do patients really have the right to die? This is really about uh, people having autonomy to decide for their own uh, body and decide for their own uh, um, health. But the right to die is not the same as the right to be allowed to die, example, by refusing life-sustaining treatment. The right to die implies that whether or not anybody has terminally, uh, terminal illness, they still do have the right to die. And having a right to die implies that there's an obligation on the part of the, the medical team to provide uh, um, a form of death in the form of euthanasia. As you can see, this is a very controversial and very polarizing uh, topic with arguments both for and against. So these are some of the main arguments uh, advanced by proponents and opponents of euthanasia. Arguments in favor of euthanasia, uh, as said previously, really revolves around um, autonomy. Uh, and that patients have an inalienable right to self-determination. So patients can decide how, where, 
and when they are going to die. Arguments in favour of euthanasia also include things like euthanasia is really an extension of palliative care. Okay? It is a profoundly humane, merciful and noble humanitarian gesture because it relieves suffering and that it is a logical and reasonable extension to end-of-life care involve, involving only an incremental expansion of uh, practices that are legal and are seen as ethical. It also bypasses physicians' reluctance to accept patients' advanced directives and their requests to limit interventions. And it can be carried out humanely and effectively with negligible risk of slippery slopes. Arguments against euthanasia include the fact that intentionally taking a human life is wrong uh, and is a violation of a universal moral code, regardless of uh, um, uh, whether the patient wants or not. The value of respect for autonomy must be balanced by other values, particularly respect for individual human life and respect for human life in general. It is different in kind from other palliative care interventions <clears throat> aimed at relieving suffering, uh, such as pain, relief, um, and from respect for patients' refusals or, of life support treatment. Opponents of euthanasia also believe that slippery slopes are unavoidable, as can be seen from um, the, the sliding from voluntary euthanasia to non-voluntary euthanasia in the Netherlands. It also introduces an unacceptable potential for miscommunication within the doctor-patient relationship and is incompatible with the role of physician as the healer and would erode the character of the, the hospital as a safe refuge. So, if euthanasia is ethically wrong, is physician-assisted suicide more ethical? The fact that the physician is removed from the actual act of killing makes uh, physician-assisted suicide more acceptable ethically to some people. However, the goal and the intention of the action is the same. It causes the death of the patient, whether the, the physician is directly injecting the medication or prescribing it to be taken by the patient. Don't forget, when the physician prescribes the medication, he knows that the patient intends to take it to bring about his own death. So physicians are supposed to heal. So if both euthanasia and uh, physician-assisted suicide are legalized, physicians are now then licensed and compensated by society to terminate the life of a person. This goes against the grain of the ethos of being a physician. So even though the patient has the ultimate control and that he can change his mind and not take the prescribed medication after all, this fact may not make the physician less culpable. Ultimately, euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide reflects on social values that we accept and act communally on a person's judgment that his life is not worth living. So these social and uh, societal ramifications uh, to condoning, legalizing, to condoning and legalizing euthanasia and uh, physician-assisted suicide may not be what we want for society as a whole. Finally, if euthanasia and um, physician-assisted suicide is objectionable, what about voluntary stopping eating and drinking? In some terminal and dying patients, there is a natural loss of appetite for food and fluids. However, this is not the same as voluntary stopping eating or drinking, shortened to VZ. VZ is the competent palliative patient voluntarily stopping eating and drinking as a means to hasten death. So this is not the same as the natural loss of appetite for food and fluids that sometimes happen in some dying patients. Although evidence has shown that it is not as painful a process as feared in the sense that there is some form of uh, natural analgesia caused by the physiological imbalances due to dehydration and calorie reduction, there are still resultant symptoms. The resultant symptoms like confusion, nausea and vomiting, muscle cramps, thirst, etc., however, can be addressed with appropriate palliative care. And palliative medica medications can be given as suppositories, injections or patches until the patient becomes unconscious. 
So some people have said that VZ may be a, a more ethical uh, alternative to euthanasia or physician-assisted suicide. However, is that true? And if it is true, are, phys are physicians obligated to inform palliative patients that there is such an option of VZ? So answering the question whether there is an ethical difference between physician-assisted suicide and supporting VZ, because both contravenes the principle of non-maleficence. Broadly considered, uh, there are people who broadly consider that VZ is different ethically and legally. While they have similarities, fundamentally, physician-assisted uh, physician suicide requires a physician directly assisting a patient to hasten his death, whereas VZ can technically be completed without any clinician involvement or even without their knowledge. Then is it the same as suicide? And if, if so, then are physicians condoning suicide? So it is really difficult to tease out the arguments about whether VZ is considered suicide or not. And it is indeed also very controversial to suggest that VZ should be offered to, visit, uh, to patients as an option like any other uh, medical therapy. So what, what does the law say? Does the law in Singapore allow VZ? Physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia is not legal in Singapore. Unfortunately, the law does not address VZ specifically. So, given that VZ does involve the express intention of hastening death, some ethicists argue that even limited clinician participation in VZ, uh, either by providing counselling or managing symptoms uh, uh, towards the end, is the same as assisting with um, voluntary uh, suicide, okay, and thus should not be done. Others may argue that even though a physician considers VZ to be unethical, it is still important for the, the physician to continue to provide proper care and, and palliation for patients who are dying uh, due to VZ. However, it must, be under, it must be understood by all parties what the whole process is about. An agreement must be sought um, from uh, all stakeholders before the patient becomes unconscious and unable to decide for himself. So engagement with the, the patient in a thorough discussion of what VZ is about is very important. And that includes uh, symptom burden, the expected duration, and any other alternatives that are available to the patient other than VZ. For example, uh, palliative care uh, or uh, some form of uh, treatment that can uh, reduce the symptom burden that the patient is having. And given the significant cultural and emotional importance of eating and drinking, careful attention must be paid to a patient's uh, legal surrogate decision maker or their family members uh, to provide education on what VZ is about and to answer any questions before the end uh, approaches. And because it is such a contentious uh, 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 topic, we must allow medical staff who are moral objectors to opt out However, we must ensure that the patient continues to be cared for. And if the institution is unable to care for somebody who wants to, to uh, go on to have a VZ, then either the patient needs to be transferred to another institution or VZ should not be commenced at all. So these are the differences between what is VZ and what is physician-assisted suicide. So the method in VZ is that the patient voluntarily stops eating and drinking, whereas in physician-assisted suicide, uh, they ingest a prescribed lethal medication. So this means that the patient must be competent and must be able physically to ingest uh, the prescribed medication. The medical assistance provided in VZ is mainly managing the palliative care needs uh, towards the end, including prescribing medications uh, for symptom control. Some people even suggest that it is um, uh, uh, that the physician should even put the patient into a palliative sedation if the symptoms are hard to control. And we will talk about palliative sedation next. The medical assistance provided for physician-assisted suicide is the prescription of the lethal medication. 
time frame of death occurring in VZ is between one to three weeks, whereas in uh, physician assisted suicide, it happens very quickly within minutes to hours. But the outcome is death. Death usually occurs through terminal dehydration in VZ, whereas in uh, PAS is through the lethal medication. So I've alluded to palliative sedation earlier. Uh, I prefer the term palliative sedation to the more commonly used terminal sedation because I feel sometimes terminal sedation is often mistaken as a method of euthanasia. Palliative sedation is rarely needed in the care of, of patients at the end of life and is usually used only when it is the only way of controlling intractable pain and suffering. The intention of palliative sedation is not to cause death, but to bring the patient into a deep uh, sedative state as a means to relieve pain and suffering. Sometimes death may occur when the patient is in deep sedation, but it is then difficult to know whether the death occurred because of sedation or because of the underlying medical condition. And this brings me to the doctrine of double effect. Um, DDE is based on the idea that there is a moral difference between an intended consequence of an act, for example, death from injection of a lethal drug, and one that is foreseen as a possible consequence, but that is not intended by the, the agent or the physician. For example, death from deep sedation meant to relieve pain and suffering. However, um, to apply DDE, the following four conditions must be satisfied. The nature of act condition, which is when the act, when the action, apart from the, for, the, the foreseen side effect of death, must be either morally good or neutral. Second, the means end condition, where the bad effect must not be the means by which one achieves the good effect. So good ends does not justify evil uh, uh, means. And then third, the right intention condition, where the intention is to achieve only the right effect, uh, with the bad effect being only an unintended uh, side effect. So the intention of the person doing uh, uh, that particular um, uh, action is mainly is only for the, the good effect. And finally, the proportionality condition, that there must be a proportionately grave reason, a very serious reason uh, to permit the risk of the bad effect happening from the act that, uh, that you're going to do. So in conclusion, uh, I've discussed some palliative uh, uh, ethics surrounding palliative care. But palliative care really is integ integral to the holistic and comprehensive care of people with serious, life-limiting illnesses, as well as people at the end of life. By reflecting on ethics surrounding palliative care, it helps the physician to deliver care that maximizes the protection and the satisfaction of patient and is consistent with the values of both the patient and the physician. Palliative ethics is not limited to the patient-doctor diet. Indeed, it is driven by and can affect societal values. Therefore, it is important for us all to be informed and to reflect on palliative ethics.